Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to the um, special seminar we are having today. Um, we are excited to have Joanne C. Wilson here. I'll be introducing her later on. Um, but before we do that, a few housekeeping things. Um, if you are new to in this building, the restrooms are on the other side of the hallway there, both sides of the hallway. And then um, if you could turn, up, turn down your, my, uh, your cell phones so that it doesn't, uh, um, I guess, beep during the, <coughs> the lecture, that would be nice. Um, I also want to share to, tomorrow's uh, event, which is the main event, actually, where is a distinguished uh, lecture on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And tomorrow's topic is national and global perspectives on achieving diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM. It will be in this same room at 5 o'clock p.m. Uh, so please, if you haven't registered, please RSVP and attend that event as well. Before I introduce the speaker, I want to say a few words about the topic of today's discussion. Um, it's about the electromagnetic spectrum. And this spectrum is actually a finite resource, in a sense. But it has a very, very wide applicability in many, many fields. And so I put this up just to remind you of where, what the frequencies are and what the applications are. You could see that AM radio, shortwave, TV, FM, radar, all of these applications are there. <coughs> so. <coughs> We'll be talking more about that. And then I want to put a few quotes on, which I heard from today's NSF seminar that was hosted by Katie Wilson. Um, <laughs> the first quote says, we have a flood of spectrum, but poorly utilized. Do we even have spectrum shortage or spectrum hoarding? That's from Rinaldo Valenzuela. Another set of quotes from Monisha. Why should we reserve huge spectrum for broadcast TV? No one uses it. Another quote, we have to be smart about spectrum usage. And then we have another quote, we can use dynamic spectrum methods. And then finally she said, I don't think we will run out of spectrum. Then I have a quote from John Chioffi, who is a Stanford professor and was actually Katie's advisor. He said, AI is a solution to the efficient usage of spectrum. The reason I put these quotes up is because it will hopefully help to inform our Q&A session after the lecture today. So let me introduce the speaker. We are very excited today to have Ms. Wilson here as our second distinguished lecturer in the School of Engineering, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Distinguished Lecture Series. Ms. Wilson will be delivering her lecture tomorrow um, at 5 p.m. in this room. But today she has graciously agreed to give a special seminar <laughs> on the topic of the important work of the ITU, International Telecommunication Union. The ITU is a very important regulatory agency of the United Nations and is responsible for global allocation of frequency bands for various communication uses, for example, mobile telecoms, satellite communications, radio broadcasts, sonar, radar, and so on. The radio frequency spectrum is a precious resource we all use and we consume them for different applications, but many people know very little about it and how it's regulated worldwide. We hope to change that today, by the end of today's seminar. Ms. Wilson started her professional career at the Story Bell Labs and navigated the ups and downs of the US telecom sector, working for large multinationals, a Silicon Valley startup, a boutique consulting firm, and a mid-sized federal government contractor for NASA. Most of our career focused on international standards development and regulation in radio communications. She was elected to and served a four-year term on the ITU's radio regulation board. In 2019, Ms. Wilson moved to Geneva, Switzerland, where she holds a high-level diplomatic post in the International Telecommunication Union. That's a specialized UN agency that's responsible, again, for the development of international telecommunication standards and the regulation of the radio spectrum and associated orbits for space systems. Ms. Wilson has a BS degree and MS degree in electrical engineering from Southern University and EM College and from Stanford University respectively. 
1995, she was also a Brookings Institution Congressional Fellow. We are very, very delighted to have her here today. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Wilson to the podium. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So you can turn on my mic? Yes, please. Can you hear me? Is this okay? Okay. And uh, thank you also for the reminder to cut off my, my mobile, which never rings except when I'm giving a talk. Or it's whatever uh, unfortunate, embarrassing time. So let me make sure those are both silenced. Okay, we should, that should be fine. So good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for, uh, for spending the time with me today. Uh, when I um, was, this, it was agreed that I could come. I also wanted to give this talk uh, mainly because of how important the use of the radio spectrum is and how little people know about it uh, in terms of how it's regulated. So make sure we can, how do I move to the next slide here? This one here? This one. Okay. Thank you. So um, I'll talk first just as an introduction about the ITU and the, and the radio communication sector. Uh, and then sort of establish the, the, the legal framework for how the uh, radio spectrum is uh, regulated internationally, uh, and then go in a little bit more detail in terms of the, the key concepts within the regulations and how they are applied for space services and terrestrial services, and then finally wrap up talking about the work in the ITR study groups. So first, the ITU, um, specialized agency, for information and communications technology. Um, but what people probably don't appreciate is we're also the oldest uh, intergovernmental organization, established in 1865. Um, and at that time, it was the International Telegraph Union. So a little history. Um, when telegraph um, technology or communications occurred uh, initially, uh, people, when they were trying to send a telegraph, it would go to the border. And then that someone would have to take it, translate it into something else. And then it would get to the next and so forth. And it became very clear that um, it would, there would be a need to establish international standard for how telegraph would be, um, communications would occur. And particularly once uh, they were able to run cables and have telegraph from Europe to, to the Americas. Uh, so it was actually the, in, in uh, 1865 when that convention was adopted and the International Telegraph Union was established. Um, in 8, 1934, it became the International Telecommunications Union. I'll add more detail in between those two dates later on. Uh, and then in 1947, with the establishment of the United Nations, the ICU became one of the United Nations specialized agencies. So while the United Nations just celebrated its 75th birthday, the, uh, the ITU is actually over 155 years old. The ITU is located in, um, headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, we have 193 countries that are member states of the ITU. Uh, it is also one of the very few UN organizations that has private sector as members. So we have 516 uh, sector members. Uh, those are companies worldwide who, who have joined the ITU, as well as 212 associates and 166 academia members. So the ITU is now open for uh, universities to, to become members uh, and in actually in a, a very advantageous role because you can join the ITU as a whole as opposed to joining individual sectors, or bureaus, or sectors of the ITU. Uh, we also, uh, while the ITU is headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, and we also have a small office in New York for the, um, associated with the work in the UN, uh, the ITU has offices around the world um, which are focused on helping developing countries uh, in, this, in the establishment and the further development of their telecommunications systems and networks. 
so it is a, a broad organization. The ITU is actually uh, has a legal framework un established under three key treaties, actually four treaties. Um, the first is the ITU Constitution. That's the highest level treaty. It establishes the ITU as an institution. Uh, and further details, it's complemented in, in its convention. And then there are two administrative treaties underneath that. Uh, and the one that we'll focus on is the, the radio regulations. So the radio regulations is an international treaty. Uh, and therefore, uh, member states have treaty obligations under that. Uh, which supersede, if you're understanding international law, uh, international treaties supersede national law. So a country who signed on to a treaty has the obligation to make its national laws conform to its treaty obligations. The structure of the ITU uh, is actually has a federal structure. Uh, with with uh, the plenipotentiary conference being the overriding body overseeing the, the ITU, and it mainly it, it, it establishes, um, it's where the Constitution or Convention can be modified. Uh, there's a council that sort of operates on behalf of the Plenipotentiary Conference, which occurs every four years. Uh, but there are also three sectors. Um, the radio communication sector, okay, and that's this one here in green, and that's what I'll focus on today. Um, but in addition to that, there's the standardization sector, which does developed international standards for telecommunications, not you know, wired, for the wired networks. And then uh, the, the work in the development sector, which is our, our newest sector of the ITU, and that's the one that's focused on assisting member states, uh, particularly developing countries in the development of their networks. So now, you know, we've moved from the ITU broadly to the, the radio communications sector. And it, as a sector, has the, the goal of achieving, uh, ensuring interference-free radio communication services. It does that in a number of ways. And the first one is establishing the radio regulations and modifying it um, on, a, on a timely basis. Um, and those regulations, and also regional agreements, and I'll share with you uh, what those are, they established the agreement on how the radio spectrum should be used, as well as the orbits. So the geostationary arc, which is also a, 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 a limited natural resource, as well as all other space communications. Uh, in addition to establishing the radio regulations, then we have to apply the radio regulations. And so I'll talk more about how, those, how they're applied both in terms of the work at the national level, in terms of conforming national regulations to the requirements of the treaty, or the radio regulations, and also the work in the Bureau in terms of, of how we work to support the application of the radio regulations. Uh, and I'll, I'll go through this, the structure of the sector. Um, in addition to that, um, the ITU study groups, uh, ITUR study groups, develop recommendations which are considered international standards. So complementing the, the regulations, which are mandatory or treaty status, you also have voluntary st international standards, um, which um, even though they are voluntary, are for the most part um, you know, looked upon and, 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 and uh, most try to adhere to them. Uh, and in fact, some recommendations can be incorporated by reference into the radio regulations, giving them treaty force. So in addition to recommendations being voluntary, some recommendations or aspects of recommendations can be made mandatory by a radio conference. Uh, and then, of course, in addition to, to the, that work, we support the work in the, in the developing countries um, by providing best, um, best practices, other kinds of information, and also uh, other capacity building activities uh, that we undertake in order to help uh, developing countries, uh, but everyone really, in terms of how do they understand the regulations and how do they apply them. Filling in that gap um, between 1865 and 1934, uh, and I'm sure everyone knows that, you know, when radio was actually invented. 
which I, I'll, I'll say in the 1890s, and I, I will not enter into the debate whether it was Tesla or, Mar or Marconi. <laughs> but if we look at you know, his time frame, it was in, is in, 18, in the 1890s. And I believe it was 1901 when, our, when Marconi um, established an international uh, transmission. So now it's possible to transmit the radio, radio signals from Europe to, to the Americas. And the same way we saw with telegraph, as soon as it becomes international, there becomes a need for reaching some sort of agreement. Since there was an incident, and I think it was in 1903, if I'm correct, where a ship going from, I think, the Americas back to, back to Europe, and they try, the, this Prussian prince tried to have a communication by radio telegraph, as it was called, was not accepted because it was the wrong system, wrong standard. And then the German government decided that this was, you know, time to try to establish radio regulations the same way there were regulations on telegraph. So it was in 1906 when the conference in Berlin adopted um, the Radio Telegraph Convention, which included the first radio regulations. Radio regulations have been modified 37 times since then, uh, and bringing us to the last conference, uh, which was in uh, 2019 in, in, in Egypt. Uh, in addition to the, so, so the first conference 1906 for the radio regulations, uh, CCIR, um, that's the predecessor to what, I, what we call today the ITUR study groups. So that's where they start developing voluntary standards. Uh, and then in 1932, uh, the telegraph and, and, the, uh, and the radio telegraph conventions were merged and the ITU as the International Telecommunications Union was formed. Uh, 1947 not only established the ITU as a UN agency, but it also established the first inter International Frequency Regulation Board, uh, Registration Board, which is a predecessor to what is now the Radio Regulations Board that I, I had the privilege to serving as a member of for, for four years. Uh, and then 1992 is when the current structure of the ITU was established with the, with the current um, bureau, the board, the study group's current structure. And so here, here is the situation today. The, radio, the World Radio Conference sits above the sector. Uh, the sector includes its membership, so the 193 member states and, the, and the, uh, all of the sector members I refer to are considered part of the sector. Uh, the administrative body, well, I'll walk through each one of these in the next few slides. As I said, so the, the membership of the ITUR um, includes its sector members, its member states, its academia members. Uh, it's unusual, again, in the UN system to have a, um, a, a private sector membership. The radio conference, its main objective is to um, ad adopt updates to the radio regulations, and it, and it does so to ensure rational, equitable, efficient, and economical use of the radio frequency spectrum by all services. And those services, um, I don't think people appreciate fully how much the radio spectrum is used to support your everyday life. I don't think you can get up in the morning and get to work <laughs> without having used the radio spectrum in, in, in a number of different ways. Um, but in addition to your normal everyday use, think of all maritime um, activity, all ships at sea. Um, their safe transport and navigation is, depends on the, their, their use of the radio spectrum. All space services, systems, applications, satellite systems, all exploration of space obviously refers, uh, relies on the radio spectrum. All aer aeronautical use, all aviation. So when you get on a plane and travel from one place to the next, you, whether it's radio, uh, whether it's air traffic controllers or the, or the anti-collision systems and so forth. Um, so all aviation relies on the radio spectrum. Uh, weather forecasting that relies on Earth observations um, made by satellites in order to gather data, which is used in modeling weather. <laughs> 
um, and forecasting weather. And as we have climate change and we see more and devastating weather events occurring, you know, the importance of reliance on, on meteorology to tell you, you know, what area needs to be evacuated and by when. Uh, my family's in Louisiana. <laughs> This is very important to me, <laughs> but I think it's important to all of us to understand the, the vital use of the radio spectrum for, for meteorology. Um, broadcasting, whether it's you know, television or sound, uh, is still one of the prime uh, means of communication globally. Uh, and of course, you know, all of the various uses for science. Uh, and, and don't forget also radio astronomy as well um, in, in that. So, so the, the use of the radio spectrum should be vitally important to all of us uh, and it's, its efficient use and uh, its avoidance of harmful interference, which is what makes the radio spectrum um, a viable tool for us. Um, I refer to it as being the, the um, penultimate example of the commons from an economic standpoint, where it's a shared resource but if it's used, if each individual decides I'm going to use it for my own interests and ignore the needs of others, then it becomes not only unusable for others, but it also becomes unusable for, for the individual. Uh, I've talked about the radio, um, the, the WRC, preceded by every World Radio Conference, which, by the way, is a four-week conference. And whether, if that seems long, in the past, uh, there was one that was like a three-month world radio conference. Um, it's preceded by a one-week radio communication assembly. This is the administrative body. This is what this looks at and, and approves you know, any outstanding recommendations. It looks at the structure of the ITUR study groups. It estab establishes the leadership of those study groups. Um, it adopts resolutions about the working methods. It's basically an administrative um, function. Each one of the um, sectors has an advisory group, um, which basically comes, meets, looks at various issues and gives advice to the, to the director of the bureau um, that supports the work of that advisory group, of, of that sector. Unlike the other parts of the ITU, um, there's a radio regulations board. This is near and dear to my heart as I, uh, as I had the privilege of being an elected member of the board. The board has um, a number of unique functions. Um, for example, uh, in order to um, launch a satellite network, a satellite system, you need a frequency assignment for it. So you apply for you know, governments on behalf of whomever the operator is whether it's a private or public sector entity, applies to the ITU for allocation, of a free, for the assignment of frequencies, for the use by this satellite system. And, and you have seven years to, from the time when you file that to bring it into use. Um, if perchance there's reasons why your satellite system is not going to be able to be brought into use, um, in that time frame, and one, one classic example is when you know, some catastrophic event, you know, I, uh, I, I watched as a, a, you know, the, the, on the launch pad when the whole thing blew up. Um, and the, basically that, that satellite that was on that, uh, uh, that was going to be launched uh, needed to be completely replaced. It obviously was not going to make the seven year deadline. The, um, the administration had to then come back to the ITU, come to the board, and request to have an extension of that regulatory time frame in order to be able to make use of that frequency assignment. That's the kind of thing the board will consider. Um, also, uh, complaints of harmful interference from one country to another um, can, will be addressed to the board. So the board has a number of, of functions, and it's representative of the, the various member states. So those 12 members are elected at, at ITU conferences, um, at plenipotentiary conference every four years. And they represent, um, they're representative of, so from the Americas, there are two um, board members from Europe, uh, Western Europe, there are two board members from Africa, there are three board members from the Asia Pacific, there are three board members from um, sort of Central Europe, um, there are two board members, 12 altogether. And then, the, then there's the work of the study groups. 
Uh, and this is where the private sector participates mainly in the work of the ITU. And this is where uh, the preparations for radio conferences in terms of the technical work necessary to be able to determine what decisions a conference should or could make. Um, that happens by, in the ITUR study groups. Uh, one of our most important study groups is our study group that does all the propagation work and does recommendations at study group three. Um, and that is, and in fact, that's, that's the study group for which we have the, the, the largest demand in terms of the recommendations that they issue. So all the propagation models on how radio um, propagates in various frequency bands and for various services, that's all that, all that technical work is done there. And then, of course, the, there's a bureau headed by our director. Um, and the bureau supports all of the work across the, um, the, the sector. So now back to the heart of the, the, this, this um, discussion. Uh, the radio communications. <clears throat> Defined in the, is very simply telecommunications by means of radio waves. It's a very simple definition, very powerful in its, in its application. Uh, and I, here we talk about a various services. I want to draw the distinction between a service and an application. So for instance, you have the mobile service. Within the mobile service, you have many different applications. They include Wi-Fi, which is the radio local area network. They include mobile broadband, or, or what people call IMT, or you can say 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, so any G. <laughs> but that's an application within the mobile service, OK? The radio regulations allocates spectrum to services, not to the applications within them. Governments or regulators will make decisions about frequency assignments and licensing for various uses, and they will license to applications within the services that are allocated within the radio regulation. So it's very important to draw a distinction between the service and the applications within it. Uh, and we'll see a lot of issues with, in terms of how the radio regulations treats applications and how that has or has not supported further harmonization of spectrum globally. Back to the radio regulations. And this is actually both in the regulations but also in the Constitution itself. Establishes the obligations on member states. Obligations to one, Bearing in mind that these frequencies and satellite um, orbits are limited natural, natural resources, it compels them to use them efficiently, rationally, efficiently, and economically in conformity with the regulations. So the, tr the Constitution that the member states are treaty party to, parties of this treaty, are obligated to apply the radio regulations. Okay, which means they are obligated to license radio systems. Okay, so it's not just a good thing. It's that they actually have a treaty obligation to license all radio systems and to ensure that the use of the radio spectrum within their territory does not cause harmful interference. This is the next point. You know, that their stations, for whatever purpose, must be established and operated in such a manner as not to cause harmful interference into the radio services or communications of other members or recognized operating agencies and so forth. So for instance, if one country says we are receiving harmful interference and we, have the, and we now have monitoring systems and we can geolocate the source of that interference to be within the territory of another country, that other country has the obligation to shut it down. Okay, so, so this is not so this is a regulatory framework. Uh, the rationale for why do, we, why do we regulate the radio spectrum, I think we've gone through it already. You know, rational, economical, and so forth, avoidance of harmful interference, but also based on the studies, it should provide a greater assurance that the performance and the quality of the use, quality of the services that use the, the radio spectrum um, is, is, is adequate or sufficient. Um, it also, for those who are making investments in radio systems, uh, 
should give them the kind of regulatory certainty necessary for those investments. So there's a, 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 a need. If you're going to you know, invest millions and billions of dollars, and in fact, if you look at the economic activities across all different radio services, you're probably in the trillions of dollars. You need to have some certainty that they will be able to um, continue long enough to be able to get a return on that investment. Um, and then there is the, the, dis the ever going discussion about you know, achieving regional and global harmonization of the use of spectrum. And, and here is a an sort of aspirational. Um, and we are, I think now we're starting to see whether or ask the question whether or not those aspirations are being achieved more or less. I just recently um, moderated a panel where we were discussing um, the challenge that services are having at, 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 at achieving global harmonization for the different services. And, and obviously, you'll, you, you'll recognize that from the different types of services, there are many of them that need globally harmonized spectrum. Meteorology, in, in terms of being able to, to um, observe the Earth uh, and uh, measure, make measurements necessary for meteorology. Space, obviously, needs globally harmonized uh, spectrum. Um, maritime, clearly. <laughs> Aviation, clearly. The plane that takes off in one continent and lands in another continent has the same radio systems on it, needs to be able to communicate to the, the, the networks on those other continents. So um, the need for global harmonization is not just, you know, it's, an, it's, it's, a, it's not just, you know, a good to have, it's actually essential for many services. So, so why, why be in a treaty? I think this, this starts to become obvious because it's only through a treaty that we can impose international regulation. We can impose, you know, that um, the, the member states apply, apply the treaty. Uh, and also through the treaty, we can actually register stations or register frequency assignments in a master international frequency register, which gives those frequencies actual international protection. It allows, it allows someone to say, this, this frequency assignment has been registered and should not be receiving harmful interference. So as I'm receiving harmful interference, you know, I can seek to have that interference um, be addressed. This is a little bit about the last radio conference, really, uh, or radio conferences in general. Um, they occur every four years. They've, they started, it was roughly three to five years, but we've pretty much regularized them to every four years. Uh, the last radio conference uh, was in, uh, the, was in um, Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, October, November timeframe of 2019. Um, mercifully, the conference was successful and ended about a month before the pandemic started. Thank God. <laughs> We had 3,400 delegates at a, you know, in a large conference center. Uh, and had the pandemic occurred then, I don't even want to think about it. Um, I talked about it being for a four-year cycle. Um, it's kind of, it's very much a cycle. So at the end of every conference, what it does is establish the agenda for the next conference. The very next working day after the end of one radio conference is the conference preparatory meeting for the next conference, the first of two. That meeting establishes the work program within the ITUR for all of the studies that take place um, between the end of, between that conference and the, the next conference preparatory meeting. So all of these study groups on spectrum management, propagation, satellite, terrestrial broadcasting, science services, those various study groups are doing studies related to agenda items adopted by the conference, adopted for the next conference, and doing the prep preparatory work, which then it feeds into the second conference preparatory meeting. That meeting um, allows all of the work from the study groups to also be considered with proposals from the member states um, to finalize a report that, is, um, that the member states then use as the basis for their proposals to the conference. 
So you can think of this four-year process as a process of both study and analysis, but also a, a consensus building process. Because it's the most remarkable thing that you can pull, bring together thousands of people and in a four-week period, revise an international treaty. This is the only UN organization that can carry out such a, such a phenomenal feat. Um, so, the, so this is looking at the cycle from the end of the WRC in 2015 to the beginning of the WRC in 2019. Um, the RA was the week before. Again, it, it does all of its normal work, including even sending some work to the radio conference if, it, if it's necessary. And then the radio conference in 2019 spent four, four weeks and modified the radio regulations and adopted the agenda for the, next, um, for the next WRC. Looking at the, um, what the conference uh, uses as its inputs, uh, again, part of this sort of consensus building is in the four-year period, um, there are regional telecommunications organizations uh, that also consider the, the work going on in the study groups and consider the proposals from the member states in their regions, and they create regional proposals to the conference. So, in a so that's the Asia Pacific Telecommunity, the Arab State, uh, the Arab Spectrum Management Group, the African Telecommunications Union, CEPT. So that's Europe. CITEL is the Inter-American Telecommunications Commission, and the RCC, uh, Regional Communications Commonwealth, but it's really the former Soviet states. <laughs> so uh, they formed, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, they formed as a regional organization. So each one of these regional groups meets several times a year over the course of that four-year period, and they develop regional proposals that come into the conference individual member states who've also been participating in this process also can send their, their national proposals to the conference. Um, the report from the Radio Communication Assembly, there, there may be matters that the assembly deemed should be considered by the conference. They go in. The conference preparatory meeting report, it's for this point, it's for information, but it was really used by all of the uh, regional organizations and the member states in order to develop proposals to the conference. Um, the director, the, BR, the Radio Communications Bureau directors, submits a, a report. He addresses all issues that may have been challenging or any difficulties in applying the regulations in the last four years for consideration. The conference lasts four weeks, and at the end, its final acts, the decisions of the conference, are then transferred transformed into the, the next revision of the radio regulations. Uh, that's the sort of the whole process, as it were. And there's a picture of the last World Radio Communications uh, Conference uh, held in Sharm el Sheikh. And one of these tiny little figures up there is, 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 is me. I was the secretary for the plenary and secretary for the steering committee. <coughs> one of my responsibilities in my current role. And these are sort of the, the, by the numbers. So there were 16 agenda items, an additional nine issues under agenda item 9.1, which is the director's report, um, an additional 11 agenda items, 11 issues under agenda item 7. That's the agenda item that deals with coordination and notification um, procedures for uh, satellite systems. Um, one of those agenda items, one of those issues was actually um, a very important one. I'm sure people think all of them are important, but this one was particularly uh, interesting because you, you know today, of course, we have mega constellations of uh, uh, non-geostationary satellites, uh, Starlink and uh, a number of others, OneWeb and so forth. Um, and they needed to have a different way of, of bringing those constellations into use. Um, the, the, the regulations up until that point basically said, if you brought in one satellite okay, in that constellation, that constellation is considered to have been brought into use. 
Well, this obviously is not an effective regulatory approach when you're looking at satellite constellations with thousands of satellites. Um, using that approach basically would allow someone to hoard you know, frequencies um, without, bringing them, without making them effectively used. So instead, the conference considered um, a number of different proposals and actually um, created a, a process that allowed them to um, basically um, cons consider like batches, you know, like what percentage of the, of the constellation is brought into use, by what time frame. Uh, so it allows you to file them in a way that um, you can then say, okay, well, if only a portion, maybe you don't have access to all of the spectrum that you've originally applied for, maybe you can you, you, you only need a smaller amount if you've only brought in, or you're only using a, a smaller number of sat satellites than what you originally uh, proposed. Um, by, again, by the number, there were you know, over 2,500 different proposals to the conference. There were, uh, of those, uh, you know, 51 amend uh, resolutions were amended. Uh, there were 163 countries participating. Uh, in the conference or member states along with 129 different sector members had delegations. Here's the one that we, the challenge that we always have, um, and, and this will be more the talk tomorrow. Uh, we of course are also been trying to it, it promote gr greater diversity, equity, inclusion, and particularly more gender parity. Um, this conference only had 19% women delegates out of the 3,420 delegates that we had. That was actually sort of the high point. If you look, we started tracking and, and, and back in 2000 when there was only 12% women as delegates to the conference. So there's work that we are doing to try to encourage um, more participation, more women to be active in the work of the, in, the, in the ITU. Um, to have more leadership roles, you know, in, in, the, in the study groups and so forth. Um, but these numbers obviously will not change as long as, as women make up only a, uh, a, a relatively smaller percentage of the engineering uh, and scientists, you know, in, in the STEM fields. So as much effort as we put into it, you know, it's it also important that we collectively, globally, work on the diversity, equity, inclusion um, in, in, the, in the work in the STEM fields, particularly in engineering and computer science. So a little bit more on now sort of getting into the guts of the radio regulations. Um, we talked about um, services, various services, mobile, terrestrial, and so forth. Um, the radio uh, regulations also define a station Okay, so this is basically the, the, the equipment that uses, the, that transmits and receives radio signals. We classify services as being within terrestrial. Um, and, and under terrestrial, you have fixed mobile and radio determination. And within mobile, you have aeronautical mobile, land mobile, maritime mobile. And within these categories are subcategories. Of, of stations. These are all under the terrestrial service and a number of services that are defined as not being part of any service, um, not being defined as terrestrial and so forth. Uh, and then you have the space services. Uh, the radio regulations basically says unless it's considered, it's, it's, unless it's defined as a space service or a satellite service, it's considered terrestrial. So you have the mobile satellite, radio determination satellite, earth exploration satellite, and then subservices underneath all of those. The radio regulations define services uh, or allocate services as being either primary on a primary basis, which means that they are to be protected from interference, or on a secondary basis, which means they may operate, but they may not cause harmful interference into a station that is a, a, a primary uh, allocation, and it may not uh, receive or request protection from interference from a station in the primary service. So there's you know, a, a hierarchy within the radio regulations, uh, within, the within the allocations. Um, radio services are allocated 
um, at the, at, in, in terms of the regions that they operate. So uh, you're, we have three regions. Region one is basically Europe and Africa. Region two is the Americas. Region three is, is Asia Pacific. Um, so when we get to the radio regulations themselves, Article 5 is probably the, what I'll refer to as the heart of the radio regulations. This is where various radio services are allocated to different regions on a primary or secondary basis with the details of the, that usage established by the various footnotes. Um, so you'll see, for instance, the, the 20, uh, 495 to 505 uh, kilohertz um, is allocated globally so across all three regions, to the maritime mobile service. That's how you would read the, um, the table of allocations. Whereas opposed, as compared to, let's say, 510 to 525 kilohertz here, where in one region, region one, it's, it's allocated as part of this larger one to maritime, mobile, and aeronautical radio communications. It's split in region two to part of it only to maritime, part of it to maritime, mobile, and aeronautical. And then region three has another slight variation with region three adds some secondary allocations to the region which do not exist in the other regions. So when one goes and looks at what is the regulation, one has to go to the table of allocations, look specifically at how something is allocated, and then the footnotes will give you even further detail. So for instance, in this case, this footnote says, well, all this is true, but in these countries, <laughs> this band is allocated to fixed and mobile, except for the aeronautical mobile route services on a primary basis, and then yet another footnote and so forth. So the details of the radio regulations are, are, you know, starts with the heart of them, again, in, in the table of allocations, defining services, allocating on a primary or secondary basis with, you know, further details ex, um, provided in the various footnotes. Which then go to answer the question is why does a radio conference take four weeks? <laughs> uh, because it has to decide on the allocate, whether or not for the agenda item whether to change the radio regulations, and if so, how. Um, whether or not to incorporate by reference an IT recommendation or portion thereof into the regulation. It has to determine if there are consequential changes to other regulations based on what was done. Um, there are re resolutions and recommendations that it will revise or adopt. Um, it will consider the report of that previous assembly and take necessary actions. Uh, it will identify the agenda of the next conference and also any other urgent studies that it wants the ITUR study groups to undertake. Um, those country footnotes, that, remember I, saw, I showed a footnote with a list of countries. Um, ideally, we'd like to minimize the number of country footnotes because those are, those are um, departing from the harm, more harmonized use. So the, the, um, it can consider deleting country footnotes. Of course, the director's report, okay, these were the, the changes that the director proposes in order to address difficulties in implementing the regulations. And then of course, the council uh, will adopt the agenda of the next conference based on the recommendation of the previous. How I'm doing time-wise. Um, quickly on regulation of space services. Um, and I think it's pretty obvious now why we need to regulate space services. The key issue is, of course, um, space receives transmissions and reception and uh, transmission from Earth stations uh, and other transmissions on Earth. And of course, that has to be regulated so that those transmissions don't cause harmful interference into other space services. And likewise, space services can, can cause interference into, use of space frequencies can cause interference into um, other, other services. So is space big enough 
is there, it, it's, how do we address the risk of interference? And there's, put this all together in one, just show it all together. Um, so the, the, the tools by which that's done um, in order to provide equitable access and control interference is one, the allocation of uh, frequencies to various services. Two, it's the adoption of power limits on the use of those frequencies. So PFD limits to protect terrestrial systems services, EIRP to protect space services, EPFD to protect um, geostationary from non-geostationary services. So different types of power limits established in the radio regulations in order to protect from harmful interference. Um, the obligation to coordinate. So when you're bringing a space service into use, you have to apply, and then the radio regu the, the bureau identifies what other space services could be interfered with by your use of the spectrum. And then that member state is, is informed that their service may, their, their frequency assignment may be negatively impacted and the, the member states are required to coordinate with each other in order to be able to bring into use additional services. And then finally, upon completion of coordination, if that's required, um, re the recording into a master international frequency register, which the Bureau does and which the Bureau publishes every two weeks. And then finally, there are international monitoring system, which has um, a number of governments have established international spectrum monitoring. So when we have complaints of harmful interference, we can um, seek the support of the various member states to utilize their monitoring systems in order to identify the source of that interference in order to then establish the communication with that member state to ask them to abide by their treaty obligations to please shut down that harmful interference. How do we share? This is a, uh, two mechanisms in the radio regulations. One of them is uh, the coordination, which I just described. So there's, so that, and the analogy here is first come, first serve. <laughs> you, uh, you, you want a parking spot, you know, first one in, first one gets. Okay, so that'll give you the, the most use of the, the radio spectrum. Um, but that doesn't be, that won't, so that'll be your efficiency, but that won't necessarily be equitable. So the other approach is a planned approach where every, every country is allocated um, or allotted a, a, a place, reserved resources that they can use for their, their system, whether they're using them or not. So, so it's a balance between, you know, efficient, versus, you know, um, versus equitable use of the radio spectrum. And I think I just basically talked through, through this, this particular slide here. Um, so predetermined for planning, plans established for future use uh, with priority for different countries, the right to make use of those plans. And these are a list of the different plans that are in place, in the, mainly in the, for the different regions within various frequency bands. We have a broadcasting satellite plan for the service and feeder links. We have a fixed satellite service plan. And these, these are um, plans that the, the ITUR, the Bureau administers. For terrestrial services, we also have allotments. Um, to, so for worldwide, and this is mainly to support maritime and aeronautical, various frequency um, plans have been established to support their use. And then regional plans, um, this is mainly for, um, it's for uh, maritime, um, also aeronautical radio navigation, uh, as well as a, a, a number of uh, broadcasting plans um, if you think about it, um, within the frequency bands for sound and television, um, the U.S. enjoys having a large territory and only two neighboring countries, you know, with big borders that we 
that you know, we, we really coordinate nationally with on a bilateral basis. Um, but the rest of the world, where you have a lot of small countries with a lot of neighbors, um, they, they need to have plans where the ITU comes and works with them in order to be able to allocate frequencies within the plan to the different countries so that they can make use of them without causing harmful interference into the others. Into the others. And this is all recorded in the Master International Frequency Register um, of Assignments. If we look at that register in more detail, uh, there, were, there are nearly 3 million frequency assignments in the master registry. Uh, of those, uh, nearly 900,000 are to ship stations and 20, over 2,300 to coastal stations. Uh, and then this, just in 2020, we, we processed um, nearly, uh, nearly a quarter million um, notifications of frequency assignments to the plans. So it is a, a, a massive under, undertaking uh, in order to ensure that the radio spectrum is, is effectively utilized by all of the various services. Um, for maritime, uh, we publish uh, every year or every two years a list four and list five, which is a list of ship stations and maritime mobile service identifier assignments, that's list five, the list of coast stations and special service stations, that's list four, as well as the, the maritime manual. And all ships at sea carry these uh, publications on them. And let me wrap up with a little bit, I'll go quickly through our various study groups. Again, it's a four-year cycle of activities. Um, uh, which is um, supported by the, 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 the radio advisory group, you know, looks at and advises the, the, the director on the, the work within these study groups. Uh, they adopt reports and recommendations and handbooks. They conduct studies for the radio conference. Um, they approve resolutions, changing their working methods and so forth. These next slide, this slide just shows all of the different study groups and their respective working parties. Uh, so like I said, the, some of our most important work is done by the study group three and its working parties on propagation fundamentals, point-to-point -point propagation, uh, ionospheric propagation and radio noise, as well as earth to space propagation. Uh, study group four is the um, satellite services. Study group five is the fixed services excuse me, is terrestrial services. Uh, study group six is broadcasting. Uh, seven is all our, the, the various science services. And then of course, uh, everyone has to agree on vocabulary. And these are a number of the topics that are addressed in addition to the preparation for the radio conference. And uh, I think this may be my last slide these are the topics on the agenda of the upcoming conference, which will be in um, November, December 2023. Uh, it will be held in the, the United Arab Emirates, uh, and it has a number of interesting topics on its agenda. And now, lastly, the output of the um, study groups are their reports, recommendations, and handbooks. Thank you. Yes. So, I, I would like to know if uh, what is the relevance of this to internet and whether uh, this ITU or that is an organization just for internet. Okay, so the ITU. So, so my focus was on radio. And in that context, access to the internet by wirelessly through either mobile broadband systems, Wi-Fi. So those are the, the main radio, you know, and, the, and we are also seeing more satellite-based systems that are uh, particularly with the, the new, you know, low Earth orbiting satellites, large constellations, which will have much lower latency than the, the geostationary and which should and for what we've seen, 
you know, as everyone proposes, should be able to provide much broader uh, coverage um, in order for people who have not had good access to the internet, rural areas and low density areas, to finally have good access via satellite based systems much more economically and affordably than, um, than the deployment of terrestrial systems in, in those areas. Um, so that's the, the, the radio side. Um, from the, you know, from on the um, fixed side, okay, wired side, um, the ITU is um, the, the main internet standards are, are not developed within the ITU. Okay. ITF. They're by, exactly. They're, they're developed within the Internet, internet Engineering Task Force, IETF, uh, and that's under the um, ISOC, the Internet Society, is, is the organization that manages the development of, of, of Internet standards. Um, then, of course, you know, the, the issues in terms of addresses, name and numbering, and so forth, those resources are by ICANN, mainly, in terms of the, uh, so the ITU, is not um, is not the the regulator for you know those resources. Yes. I have many detailed questions, but I have one overarching question. I think will be of general interest. Okay. Could you clarify the relationship between WRC nineteen, in this case, the ITU study groups, in this case five D, and the national regulatory body? terms of the frequencies that WRC specifies. At WRC 19, there were four sets of frequencies, all millimeter waves, specified for 5G, from 24 gigahertz to uh, the 80. 71 gigahertz. Right. I'm reading an article I wrote about it. And this then was taken to 5D, working party 5D, to update M1036, which specifies the frequencies to be frequency arrangements for terrestrial five, uh, uh, 3G, 4G, 5G. Now, my burning question is, when that is finished, and it's not finished yet, tomorrow there's a meeting about it, does the national regulatory body have to abide by those, those frequencies, frequencies right. by law? Uh, or can they pick their own? And the reason I'm asking this, it seems that the FCC is paying no attention to it. So. In particular, the 12 gigahertz. Uh, I sent so, an email about it. Yes, yeah, and, and in fact, I am. Yeah, and in, and in fact, I actually took a moment and checked the radio regulations specifically for 12 gigahertz band. So let me back up a few things. So remember I said early on, the, out, the ITU radio regulations allocates frequencies to radio services, not to applications, okay? So this is one of the fundamental challenges that we have right now, is we have over 17 gigahertz of spectrum where in the footnotes, it says this band is identified for IMT, you know, with some other, you know, thing. And it, and, and it, but it, most of those footnotes also say, and this identification does not establish priority within the radio regulations. So it's, it's, it's a soft encouragement, but it is not a regulation. So the FCC or Ofcom in Switzerland can adopt any frequencies they want? Yes. That defeats the whole purpose of global harmonization. Yes, it does. Absolutely. One would hope that all of the effort to, so first of all, the, the, the studies about IMT looked at it from the standpoint of, is this a good frequency band for a high density mobile application, which is IMT, okay? And in some cases, it said yes, and in other cases, it said no. And it identified bands within the radio regulations for, you know, that these services are encur basically encouraging administrations to use the bands that are identified for the, that service, okay? The problem is, because again, it's an application under a service and the identification is, does not have regulatory force, administrations are free, legally, to consider other frequency bands. To put IMT elsewhere, 
and to put other things in the bands that, that are identified for IMT. So the radio regulations does it's not, not binding on the regulator. It's not binding on the regulator. But you would think that the, the, the broader benefit of globally harmonized use of spectrum for these services would compel administrations to follow the regulations. Okay. Sadly, this is, this, in the US. this is this is being recorded. So let me just say these are my words. I'm now not speaking on behalf of the ITU. I'm speaking on behalf of me. Sadly, the US tends to want to adopt its own regulations and then encourage the rest of the world to follow the US and and, and use that as a means to try to push the conference into adopting decisions that are consistent with the way the U.S. has already decided things. Classic is that is the the allocation twenty I think it's twenty seven gigahertz, where the, the the globally it was not allocated to the mobile service and it was not identified for IMT, but the U.S. had already decided to make those bands available and was trying to encourage the ITU, the radio conference, to adopt bands that weren't even on the agenda, weren't even on the agenda of the conference to consider those bands. So it is unfortunate that the US regulatory approach, and this is not the first time, but in particularly in terms of IMT, tends to, and I'm going to get criticized for this, tends to want to use its market weight to encourage to, to adopt its own decisions based on its own domestic needs, and then to encourage, and, promote. And the FCC is not a good citizen. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm be, to, to be really quite honest with you, it, it, you. It, it's never, it, it, in this area, it has consistently attempted to dissuade, it, to promote its own interests and not follow the collective decisions of, a, of, of the conference. Thank you very much. I have to go to another class now. I'm sorry for <laughs> Well, but I answered your question. But well, I haven't let it many more. I hope you'll find my email. Oh, no, no, it's fine. Okay. Yes. Uh, so this might be butting up a little bit more into the application side as opposed to the service side. But you mentioned the you know, pre-allocated model of the parking lot and the dynamic model of the parking lot. And it seems like at least in academic spheres, this, this kind of pie-in-the-sky goal of cognitive radio and fully dynamic spectrum access has been like this thing that we were aiming for for a while. And on that, I guess I just have two Two questions. One is, what services do you think stand the, to gain the most from dynamic spectrum access? And what services stand to lose the most by moving away from a fully pre-allocated model to something that's more dynamic? So, so first, the issue with the plans, OK? Those are plans that are adopted for specific services in specific frequency bands for specific regions. So, so depending on the service, depending upon the frequency band, you know, it may be a band that's planned, a planned band where they have allotments to various, you know, and, and so forth, or it may be an unplanned band where coordination is the, the approach that's taken. So, so that, that, those two models exist, you know, in the radio regulations, but for different services and different, different um, frequency bands. Um, so the, the issue of cognitive radio and, and um, dynamic spectrum access uh, is a challenging one because at one level, you know, we understand that there's technology that's available that wants to sort of make use of various frequency bands in a more flexible way. And if that can be done and still be consistent with the radio regulation, so, so if I'm being dynamic within the context of, of an allocation, Okay, so if the assignments can be done dynamically within, a, within the context of an allocation to a particular service, then there should be some opportunity there. Where dynamic spectrum access becomes challenging is when the access is to frequencies that are not allocated to that service. Yeah. So oftentimes people are saying, well, I want to use um, dynamic spectrum access in order to make use of TV white spaces, okay? So these are the, 
these are the frequencies that are not used in between two assignments because if they were used, they would interfere with the adjacent, you know, the, the, the frequencies in the adjacent territories. Because those frequencies, you know, they, 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 transfer, they transmit very far. So, so that's the challenge with dynamic spectrum access, is, is when it attempts to make use of frequencies that are not allocated to the service is when, is when it becomes a difficulty. Um, so I think you have to look very specifically at the regulation, the service, the frequency, the area, to see where that, that technology is most beneficial. And I'm sure there are plenty of places where that's true. And, and not apply it in areas where its application would necessarily um, be in conflict with the, the, the treaty, the radio regulations, which establishes you know, uh, protection from harmful interference. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Does the FCC care about the efficiency of the use of the spectrum by country? And then the second part of that is, does FC, uh, sorry, not FCC, ITU. Does ITU have a policy on when a country decides to auction off a spec, a science spec? So, so first and foremost is the radio regulations recognize the sovereignty of, cover, of, of each country to regulate spectrum within their borders, okay? Their sovereignty um, prevails so long as they do not cause harmful interference into the, the use of another, by another country of the radio service in accordance with the radio regulations. And in fact, there's a, a provision, 4.4 of the radio regulations that says just that, which is, you know, you may make use of uh, frequencies in abrogation of the of the table of allocations so long as it does not cause harmful interference from to other services of other countries and and does not and of course you do not have the benefit of protection of receiving interference and you must demonstrate or say or commit that should you re should you be causing harmful interference that you would immediately shut down that service okay which is a very poor basis if, you're, if I'm trying to build a business. <laughs> I want a business that I deploy a system and that I'm protected from harmful interference and I don't, and I don't have to shut down immediately. Um, so, so the radio regulations and the ITU uh, recognize the sovereign rights of countries. Um, and so that is easier for big countries with large territories to have more flexibility within their territory um, noting that, of course, they have to be mindful of their interference into space systems because, you know, I don't care how big your territory is, you know, that transmission into space is, could be problematic. Um, as opposed to, you know, small countries, obviously, they have to abide by the regulations because they're going to interfere with each other, you know, very, very easily. Um, I don't know if they Auction. Think Auction. Oh, so, so how a government decides to allocate or assign frequencies is the sovereign decision of that. Of that. IT has no policy. ITU has no policy on that. Um, of course, you know what we encourage, promote is, is is efficient use of the spectrum, and there's a provision of the um, I think it's of the Constitution and of the of the regulations that that encourages uh, countries to to use the the, the minimum frequencies necessary for a service and to use the most advanced technology available for the service. That's, so both of those are, are part of the treaty, but it's difficult to, to, to enforce that. Any other last questions? Yes, please. Uh, forgive me if it's a dumb question, but you mentioned orbits and frequencies. And, and I, what happens when an issue that impacts one is affected by the other. I, I'm specifically thinking of like Starlink and potential debris. So that isn't a frequency issue, but it's it's a. Uh, I'm, I'm, yes. Yeah. So the the ITU does not manage objects in space. So we we look at frequency assignments um, and their use in space. So for instance, one satellite can have many frequency assignments on it, okay? 
one's frequency assignment can be used by multiple satellites, okay, so in, in like a LEO constellation. Um, so, so we do not regulate or manage objects in space. There's another agency. <laughs> So the, there's a UN, um, you, you know, so UN, um, it's like outer space, um, I, I, I give, UNOOSA, and I'm sorry, I'm re not remembering, but they actually deal with peaceful uses of space. And, and there's also um, agencies that will track all space objects, all, all debris, down to like, you know, that are within like a few millimeters or whatever size, you know, so that's, that's tracked so that satellite operators, for instance, can, can see and make maneuvers of their satellites in order to avoid um, collisions. Um, you know, of course, the, 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 the LEO space is becoming, you know, more, more, more congested, um, although I like to say space is still big. Um, and there are efforts to do things like have new industries that will actually clean up, remove space debris, and, and other kinds of activities going on along those lines. But from an ITU perspective, we deal with the use of frequencies in space, not the objects that they are, we do not regulate the objects that they're on, the satellites and so forth. Thank you. Yes, please. Political question: uh, uh -oh. are there Any countries that have not signed this treaty, and if there are, um, what remedies do you have against uh, uh, let's so, say so bad behavior? So all of the the ITU member states, um, and the way the Constitution and Convention are constructed, are signatories to the radio regulations, and they are compelled to you know, take the, the the latest version and incorporate it into their national law and so forth. Um, it takes a, a different amount of time for each country to do that. Um, but they are, um, but at, they're, they are, as member states, they're sort of signed on. <laughs> but are there countries that are not member states? Uh... There are very few countries that are not member states, but those very small few countries are not main users of the spectrum. You know, because, I mean, we're talking like small islands and, you know. I was thinking more along the lines of, let's say, North Korea or somebody like it's that. It's a member state. They are members. Yes. State. Okay. Okay, let's thank uh, Juan again. Thank you for giving this thank you. Thank you for your time.